in Japan, and it won't take long to conceive of just how powerful its drinking culture is. Venues catering to those wishing to get sloshed abound. Izakaya, that's Japanese pubs, top shelf classic cocktail dispensaries, 10 seater snack bars, British and Irish pubs, standing bars, specialized sake and shochu joints, beers flow while salarymen, freed from the shackles of work, hit up yakitori stands and late night ramen shops, while all you can drink courses, that's nomi hodai, help inundate college students socializing at karaoke. Local pride in homegrown sake, shochu, and in Okinawa, awamori abound. Japan produced foreign fare booms from whiskey. To gin, to, at long last, craft beer. Despite some recent trends, boozing it up is an almost assumed venue for interpersonal communication. So you may be surprised that there was once a concerted effort to bring prohibition to Japan. Like so many historical Japanese stories, this one begins in the 1850s with US Commodore Perry's arrival in Uraga Bay to forcibly open Japan to Western trade. Jostled from its self-imposed isolation, Japan began to look across the Pacific for cues on how to shape its society in a rapidly changing world. Fashion, technology, military and government structures, education, and architecture. The country rushed at breakneck speed towards westernization. The watchword of the day became wakon yosai, Japanese spirit, western learning. Some in Japan, however, felt the national spirit, and indeed spirits, needed remedying as well. Some believed full westernization was essential, whether via the changing of mores and religion, via the adoption of Christianity, or the introduction of foreign lexicons. Mori Arinori, the father of Japanese education, believed Japan should adopt English as its official language. From the 1880s, a growing movement in Japan began targeting the consumption and selling of alcohol. The Japanese temperance movement had been born, and a path towards prohibition was being constructed with sober determination. Yokoso, and welcome back to Unseen Japan. As always, I'm Noah Asuka, and today we're taking another deep dive into a lesser-known Japanese historical topic. This one was pretty fun to research, really touching on history from both Japan, the US, and beyond through numerous centuries. If you like this sort of thing, consider giving us a like and subscribe, or supporting our work over at Patreon. Anyway, the story's already a-brewing, and so are we. So grab a glass of Asahi, non-alcoholic or otherwise, and let's get right back to the attempt to bring Prohibition to Japan. The place of mood-altering beverages in Japan is perhaps older than the Japanese polity itself. Rice cultivation on the archipelago started about three millennia ago, and originally rather weak, rice-based alcoholic beverages have been around for nearly as long. Japanese booze gets its first historical mention in the Book of Wei, written in 3rd century China. Some hundreds of years later, the semi-historical chronicles of the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki make numerous references to drunken daring do. By the Heian period, that's 794 to 1185, when military and cultural power had coalesced around the imperial court in what is now Kyoto, alcohol had become a major ritual object of consumption for both religious and civil ceremonies. Nobles also enjoyed a variety of drinking games in their leisure time. While the government held a de jour monopoly on alcoholic beverages, bootlegging abounded in the distant countryside, deep in the mountains beyond easy court control. This would become a theme throughout much of Japanese history. The association between religion and drink deepened in the 10th century, as Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines morphed into the primary sites of the brewing of sake. As for distilled spirits, these entered Japan in the late 15th or early 16th century as part of the booming China sea trade, either through the Ryukyu Kingdom or the Korean Peninsula. This was the era in which much of the world discovered the appeal of distillation in quick succession. 
still technology had finally caught up with the ancient knowledge that had allowed for the production of perfume in ancient Mesopotamia and beyond. In Japan, this led to the creation of the archipelago's homegrown spirit, shochu. It's a miracle. Shochu Climax. Bun. Near at hand, the Ryukyu Kingdom created its own powerful intoxicant, Aomori. In the hotter regions of what is now Okinawa Prefecture and Kyushu, where older sake production methods led easily to spoiling in hot weather, distilled drinks were a godsend. The sharing of drink in communal settings was a major ritual of many agrarian communities across Japan. Shogunal authorities placed heavy taxes on alcohol production, which once again led bootlegging to abound. As populations grew in the metropole of Edo, which is modern Tokyo, soon the world's largest city, drinking became an easy way to break down old social barriers and get along with one's neighbors. Life in the Nagaya, the long row houses of the general Edo population, was claustrophobic and crowded. A shared drink, however, could help make community life that much easier. In 1854, upon Commodore Perry's second visit to Japan, more than two centuries of relatively strict isolation came to an end. Oh, I'm Perry. Nice to meet you. Japan begrudgingly opened up to trade and treaties with Europe and North America. The floodgate was open to alien inventions and goods. These had previously been semi-banned, entering the Japanese islands through limited gateways in Nagasaki, Eizo, which is modern Hokkaido, Ryukyu, and Tsushima. Nestled amongst the foreign military goods, textiles, technology, and more were previously unknown beverages. Whiskey, wine, beer, and cocktails started a new vogue in port cities like Yokohama, and eventually, Tokyo. Native drinking culture melded with cultures from abroad, creating the alcoholic milieu we now know in Japan. Said culture would become so ingrained as to sometimes feel inseparable from Japanese social and professional life. Booze allows for a socially acceptable pathway to lowering the fortified walls of hierarchy. Hence the term nomination, drinking communication, for frank business discussions over beers and sake. This paragraph from Stefan Lyman and Chris Bunting's The Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks explains the situation well. In modern Japanese life, the nomikai, the drinking party, is a near necessity to socialize, succeed academically, get ahead in business, and even marry. People make new friends by attending drinking parties organized by their existing friends. Professors drink with their students. Students drink with their classmates. Bosses drink with their employees. Employees drink with their coworkers. An entire matchmaking industry has grown up based around bringing strangers together to meet members of the opposite sex in social environments revolving around drinking. All in all, Japanese social activities are highly alcohol-focused. But not everyone appreciated this soused-up direction Japanese culture was moving in. Flashback to the 1850s, and the years before Commodore Perry's expedition to open Japan. Cross the Pacific in the young United States, a country little known to the Tokugawa shogunate, a new movement was taking shape. It was named for a concept thought virtuous since the times of the ancient Greek philosophers, temperance the act of self-control. In the coming decades, the idea of self-control would become, instead, one aimed at controlling others. Prohibition. In the United States and the colonies that preceded it, the imbibing of alcohol had long been done almost out of necessity. Water sources were often tainted, and beer, and especially cider, were safer sources of daily hydration. Since alcohol levels were low in such drinks, they could be imbibed throughout the day without achieving great levels of drunkenness. The boom in more powerful distilled spirits and the flourishing of saloons to provide them greatly changed this situation. Suddenly, drunkenness became a vast societal problem. Nowhere were the dangers presented by drunkenness more felt than in the household. As Victorian mores made their way into U.S. society, women were increasingly segregated into the life of homemaker. As laboring men indulged more in drink outside of the home, they would return in a drunken, sometimes violent, stupor. 
Women and children bore the brunt of violence and the economic burden that came with a more drunken society. They found strange bedfellows in the captains of industry who saw drunken workers as a threat to industrialized capitalism. They needed employees who could work long hours doing repetitive work, and rampant drunkenness and hangovers were bad for the bottom line. Commodore Perry returned to the United States in 1854, his mission to Japan a success. He'd left bottles of whiskey behind in Japan as a celebratory gift to the country's new Japanese trading partners. Indeed, Perry had gifted the Emperor of Japan with a 110-gallon barrel of the powerful beverage. The gift was surely meant to demonstrate the value trade with the United States had to offer. In his own country, however, a will towards alcohol prohibition was steadily picking up steam. By the time of the Civil War, which was a mere seven years on in Perry's future, 11 U.S. states and two territories had put, weakly enforced, prohibition laws into effect. Postbellum, the dichotomy between expanding drink culture and temperance was even starker. Saloons propagated like mad in the American frontier. They were a place for the hard-worked prospector, miner, or rail worker to release their worries and find companionship friendly or otherwise. From the perspective of wives and mothers, these saloons were dens of iniquity that siphoned their family's money and debauched their husbands. Women could not vote, and their political activism was frowned upon. But within the confines of the church and home life, they could moralize. Women began to use these venues to campaign against alcohol as a societal sin and a danger. In 1874, six years on from the Meiji Restoration that would spell the end of feudalism in Japan, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was formed in the United States. Church-going woman teetotalers thrilled at the success of a mass protest movement against saloons that had closed 30,000 shops across Middle America, sought even greater societal change through the WCTU. During the last decades of the 19th century, the Women's Christian Temperance Union became the largest women's organization in the United States. A respectable org primarily made up of interdenominational, church-going, Caucasian women, it also allowed women to agitate for suffrage in a way that seemed non-radical. Under the leadership of the celebrated Frances E. Willard, the WCTU quadrupled in size. Soon, its vast and varied membership felt it was its duty to bring the good word of temperance and prohibition beyond America's shores. Willard looked across the Pacific, and there she saw the newly opened heathen land of Japan. Willard's inspiration to evangelize temperance to the nations of East Asia came in 1883. She had traveled to San Francisco as part of an organizing tour where she was led to the local Chinatown by one Reverend Otis Gibson, a former missionary to China and the first pastor to the Japanese on the U.S. Pacific Coast. Willard was shocked by the stupor of addicts in the local opium dens, as well as by the flagrantly flaunted temptation of Chinese prostitutes in a neighboring house of shame. She would write that, In presence of these two object lessons, the result of occidental avarice and oriental degradation, there was born in upon my spirit a distinct illumination resulting in this solemn vow. But for the intrusion of the sea, the shores of China and the Far East would be part and parcel of our own. We are one world of tempted humanity. We must be no longer hedged about by the artificial boundaries of states and nations. We must utter as women what good and great men long ago declared as their watchword. The whole world is my perish, and to do good, my religion. That same year, Willard proposed the formation of the World WCTU, whose goal would be to belt the globe and join the East and West. Before the end of 1883, divorced Boston schoolteacher and temperance activist Mary C. Levitt had left on a mission trip across the Pacific, heralding the beginning of the World WCTU's global activities. In 1886, she finally reached Japan. Just as the art of cocktails first entered Japan through the port of Yokohama, so too would the temperance movement that aimed to ban them. Now, by no means was the concept of prohibition absent in Japanese history. 
Buddhism, often the favored religion of the imperial court, is not so prescriptive towards alcohol as Islam or Mormonism, nor is it as embracing of drink as Judaism or various forms of Christianity. Buddhism generally holds that inebriation is a pathway to carelessness best avoided. At various times, the emperor would issue edicts against alcohol. Six such decrees were made between the years 646 and 770 alone. Although just how much the average peasant in the countryside looking forward to a sake-soaked harvest festival obeyed such edicts, or was even aware they existed, is suspect. The Christian missionaries bound for Japan from its opening in 1854 brought with them a temperance movement that was perhaps more zealous. A temperate mindset prevailed even before the WCTU's arrival. The first converts to Christianity in Japan post Perry, when Japan technically still banned the religion, were those baptized by hired workers, that's Oyatoi Gaikokujin, brought to the country to introduce Western technology and modes of thinking. Many of these foreign teachers were conservatively minded Christians who believed their religion was the cornerstone upon which Western society rested and through which it found success. Once Christianity was legalized in 1873, waves of Japanese intellectuals converted under the influence of such teachers, believing it to be a necessary step on the path to modernization. Early Meiji saw the biggest boom in Christianity in Japan since the mass conversions and subsequent violent shogunal backlash and religious prohibition in Kyushu nearly 300 years earlier. The Christianity being taught by the hired foreigners was a puritanical one, prohibitive towards sexual philandering and insisting upon the keeping of the Sabbath. It also forbade the smoking of tobacco or the drinking of liquor. Uchimura Kanzo, an early Meiji convert, recalled the difficulty with which he upheld these moral standards. Still tenaciously holding teetotalism as a part of my Christian profession, I was scrupulously careful not to touch fiery liquid even if presented with the most plausible of reasons. Mary C. Leavitt arrived in Japan in 1886 at the height of the Japanese government's favorable views towards her Christian religion. At the same time, Japan was under the thumb of Western governments who had enacted onerous, unequal treaties with the country. The belief among the political leadership in Tokyo was that adhering to Western dress, architecture, political structures, culture, and indeed religion would allow countries like the United States and the United Kingdom to view their Japanese counterparts as equals. It was fertile ground for the WCTU to spread its religiously oriented anti-alcohol gospel. Levitt was concerned not only with the religion or prohibition, but also with the uplift of Japanese women. Staying with American missionaries who had made inroads in the Tokyo-Yokohama region in the 1870s, she used those connections to make contact with Japanese Christian women. Her goal was the establishment of Japan's first women's union. The Meiji Restoration of 1868 had upended Japanese society and completely altered the feudal class system. Japanese women, however, were still left in subservient positions within their households. Their legal status and rights weak. In the years before Levitt's arrival, women like Kishida Toshiko and the so-called civil rights grandma, Kusuno Sekita, had agitated for greater rights for women. Despite the constrained life lived by many women in Europe and the United States, Christianity was seen as more egalitarian than Japan's Neo-Confucian social structure. Levitt found many Japanese women who were excited both by Christianity and by the opportunity to expand their roles in society. Levitt, however, encountered a Christian atmosphere in Japan much different from that of the WCTU back in the United States. The evangelizing was led by male missionaries who had disembarked on Japanese shores during the final years of the shogunate, whereas the WCTU had normalized women speaking, ministering, and activism in the United States, women were still expected to remain silent within Christian spheres in Meiji-era Japan. Japanese society itself being so patriarchal, although the United States wasn't much better, let's be honest, most female missionaries thought it was wise to constrain their activities so as to not turn Japanese public opinion against Christianity. Levitt saw the restrained activities of the non-WCTU female missionaries as disappointing. 
For her, women had as much a place to preach and ordain with the ministry as men. Indeed, the WCTU saw women as coming more easily to true morality than men. Under her guidance, women from her organization would have meetings and speak to Japanese converts of both genders. Her efforts found great success, with the Tokyo WCTU being formed in 1886. The Japanese women of the Tokyo WCTU fervently strove to correct gender double standards in Japan, focusing especially on enforcing the sanctity of marriage. Japanese men had long sought out geisha, courtesans, and mistresses as a matter of course. The WCTU, inspired by popular Protestant views on marriage, aimed to ban all of these. Temperance and teetotalism, however, never really caught on with Japanese women. High-strength spirits had yet to become fully popularized in Japan, and drunkenness was not the endemic issue for Japanese households and the women that ran them that it was in the US. Despite its name, the Japan Women's Christian Temperance Union would never ask its members to make the standard pledge to live a life free of alcohol. In fact, in Japanese, the group's name mentioned neither alcohol nor even Christianity. It was known as the Tokyo Women's Moral Reform Organization. The Tokyo Fujin Nanika 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 Kai. I can't read those characters. What is that? How, how do you say this? <laughs> a few moments later. Tokyo Fujin Kyofu Kai. Unlike in the United States, the cause of temperance and of prohibition would remain in large part the domain of men. None of this is to say that Mary C. Levitt and the WCTU did not have a major impact on temperance in Japan, much the opposite. Levitt preached to crowds of thousands on the topic, visiting sites around Japan and spurring the revival of small and mostly non-active temperance organizations previously formed in the 1870s. But the organizations that took her anti-alcohol views to heart were mostly led by and consisted of men. Some of these organizations were made of well-to-do Japanese Christians, and others consisted of Buddhist monks inspired by the movement against inebriants. All these Japanese men were willing to listen to Levitt and her successors with a level of attention they would never have granted Japanese women. In the mindset of the time, American women, despite their gender, still held the power of being Western, and thus worth taking seriously. For their part, many American women looked down on Japanese men as feminized. Writing in 1894, Kate Bushnell, one of Levitt's successors in Japan, summed up the strange gender and racial dynamics at play in the Japanese temperance movement. It is exceedingly difficult to make a whole convert to Christianity out of a heathen man. The truth is he would rather hold back that part of the coming of the kingdom described as the realm where there is neither male nor female. A Japanese brother professing to be a most earnest Christian said to us, Why do you spend time with women? You have only to address the men, and when they become temperance men, they go home and tell their households what they must do. How sublimely simple. To his mind, we only need to do half the amount of temperance preaching and exalt the virtue of obedience and servility in the other half who do not hear. With the Japanese WCTU focused on issues like prostitution, marital fidelity, and, in its more radical sections, women's social rights and suffrage, American WCTU missionaries needed to look to Japanese men to stress their favorite issue of temperance. Doing so via religious sermon became more difficult as the pendulum swung back against Christianity. By the 1890s, it had become clear that merely aping the West would not make Japan equal in the eyes of foreign nations. A major backlash against westernization was underway, and that included Christianity. Many Japanese converts who had embraced Christianity for its modern trappings left the religion behind. The WCTU was willing to preach to men in order to popularize their message in Japan. So too, it seemed, were they willing to sublimate their religious evangelism for the cause of temperance. Speeches by women from the American WCTU began to focus more on scientific reasons for prohibition. As the country became more jingoistic during the Sino-Japanese War from 1894 and the Russo-Japanese War 1904, and beyond, finding ways to link nationalism and the banning of alcohol seemed prudent. 
Even earlier, in 1892, WCTU organizer Mary West lectured a Japanese crowd of thousands on how alcohol was a threat to their polity. Alcohol is a menace to your food supply by destroying annually 4 million koku of rice, the staff of life. Hear of the burdens of taxation it imposes by increasing crime, pauperism, and insanity. America did not guard against the danger and is now suffering the consequences. The great liquor interest there is almost exclusively in the hands of foreigners. I fear the same will be the case in Japan if you do not now stop the vile stream which has begun to flow into your land. The result of all this was that by the turn of the 20th century, the temperance movement in Japan had grown, but had also grown away from Christianity. Increasingly, it was a secular, nationalistic, and even imperialist movement led not by Japanese women, but by powerful Japanese men. In 1898, just before the turn of the century, the numerous temperance organizations from across the archipelago were finally brought under a single umbrella. This was the Japan Temperance Union, Nihon Kinshu Domekai. The organization's inaugural president was one Ando Taro, former consul general to the Kingdom of Hawaii. A former inveterate drinker, Ando had seen firsthand the ravages of alcoholism that had affected many in the Japanese community in Hawaii. His wife, Ando Fumiko, was in contact with Japanese Christians in the US and learned of and was inspired by the temperance movement there. When two bottles of sake were delivered to the Hawaii consulate, she smashed them, as she'd heard temperance activists did in the United States. Her husband followed her lead, becoming one of Japan's foremost anti-booze advocates. Despite internal conflict over the movement's association with increasingly unpopular Christianity, the union found some real success. It had members in high places, including in the aristocracy and both houses of parliament. In 1900, one influential leader, a former samurai and member of the lower house named Nemoto Sho, managed to help pass a bill prohibiting minors from accessing tobacco. He introduced a similar bill to ban the sale of alcohol to minors, and each time it was rejected, he would simply introduce the same bill again the very next year. He would do this for 23 years running. In 1912, the Meiji Emperor passed away. The relatively open and democratic Taisho era began. Then, in 1917, temperance activists in Japan watched on as the United States Senate passed the 18th Amendment. In 1920, enough states ratified the amendment prohibiting the sale of alcohol for it to go into effect. More than half a century of work by American temperance organizations and activists had come to startling fruition. The United States was now a dry nation. For those in Japan, the question became, can we do the same? The Japanese public would have none of it. As the movement to follow in the United States footsteps and enact a Japanese prohibition got underway, it faced immediate opposition. Across the Pacific, the Brewers League and other booze business interests had long managed to hold off a popular temperance movement that involved millions of American teetotalers. It was only during the World War I years and ensuing mass xenophobia against anything Germanic that public opinion moved against the mostly German brewers to the extent that prohibition could be voted into reality. Japan lacked both a foreign boogeyman to blame for booze and a popular movement nearly as passionate as US temperance. Prohibition was simply a step too far. The English-language Japan Chronicle recorded stories of anti-prohibition activists driving around Japanese cities to distribute piles of pro-booze leaflets, just as temperance reformers claimed that alcohol scientifically degraded populations and nations, pro-drink crusaders argued the opposite. Advanced civilizations, they said, only arise when a nation embraces alcohol. Such spurious arguments notwithstanding, true prohibition never gained enough steam to stand a chance of enactment. Across Japan, a grand total of 17 villages went dry. Meanwhile, as described in Japanese drinks, the rest of Japan spent the Prohibition era picking the bones of America's alcohol industry, shipping over secondhand equipment from defunct US firms to help build its fledgling beer and wine industries. In 1922, however, Japanese temperance gained its greatest victory. Shonemoto's annual bill to limit the drinking age to those 20 years or older finally passed. 
For the first time, minors were disallowed to drink in Japan. The movement would go on to press for the age of drinking to be raised to 25, but this would never come to be. The Great American Experiment in Prohibition came to an end in the early 1930s. Despite causing some amount of reduction in overall drinking, the supposed drying out of America had instead created a mass crime boom. The United States had become a nation of scofflaws, and the huge profits to be made in bootlegging had turned petty thieves into millionaires leading organized crime empires. Racked by the Great Depression, the US government began to pine for the taxation once received from the liquor industry. Farmers who had been for prohibition in the 1910s lamented the damage it had done to the agricultural business. The 21st Amendment, the only in US history created to repeal a previous constitutional amendment, was ratified on December 5th, 1933. The temperance movement in the United States never recovered. Across the ocean in the Empire of Japan, which now spanned from Sakhalin in the north to Micronesia in the south, agitation for temperance persisted. That now shifted almost entirely to a movement organized on a militant nationalistic line. Military higher-ups worried about drunkenness in the ranks. Captains of industry wanted Japanese factories operating in tip-top shape for the various war efforts. The Japan Temperance Union slogan became Prohibition Patriotism. Kinshu Hokoku. But perhaps most disturbingly, many temperance advocates and thought leaders became strong allies of Japan's eugenicist movement. Such activists saw alcoholism as a hereditary stain upon Japanese society, culling it would be to the benefit of the empire. Despite controversy over how hereditary alcohol addiction actually was, Prohibition campaigners supported the submission of numerous eugenicist laws to the imperial diet throughout the 1930s. Perhaps their greatest inspiration was the Law for the Prevention of Hereditary Diseased Offspring, a eugenicist statute passed in 1933 in Nazi Germany, legalizing the compulsory sterilization of those deemed genetically unfit. The law included a clause for the sterilization of alcoholics. Ironically, such bills were most vociferously opposed by Japanese ultranationalists, who saw them as an insult to the Amato people. If the Japanese were in fact uniquely descended from the gods, how could you say that some of their genes were inferior and needed culling? Despite opposition, a weakened eugenics law went into effect in 1940. But alcoholics were not in the end among the targets of sterilization. Nonetheless, many thousands of people would be subject to forced sterilization when deemed mentally unfit or diseased. A post-war successor bill was only repealed in 1998. The third fleet gathers for the occupation of Japan. Tokyo announcing surrender. Allied Commander General MacArthur has ordered airborne and seaborne landings. American warships are on their way to Tokyo. In 1945, the Japanese Empire suffered unconditional defeat in World War II. The war had done what prohibition activists could not. Bombings destroyed ancestral breweries and distilleries from Okinawa to Aomori, completely dislocating the Japanese alcohol industry. When the US occupation of Japan began, various sake prohibitions were put in place in order to redirect rice towards a famished populace. Bootlegging and moonshining soon appeared to fill the void. In the depressed and often desperate post-war years, many turned to drink of questionable, even dangerous quality. Soon, however, Japan experienced its second westernization boom once again at the hands of the Americans. As the country rebounded, foreign liquors again became all the rage. Traditional industries like sake and shochu came once again to thrive alongside whiskey and beer. Japan remains a very boozy society, and neither temperance nor Christianity have gained much of a foothold in the decades since the war. Meanwhile, alcoholism has become a much worse problem than it was in the early Meiji era, back when American missionaries regaled crowds of thousands with the ills of liquor. The Japan Temperance Union still exists in a rump state, as does the Women's Christian Temperance Union back in North America. 
With its numbers greatly diminished since the 1950s, the JTU's mission has become one of abstinence rather than temperance. Its energies are now focused on assisting alcoholics in recovery rather than prohibiting drink throughout Japan. Still, Japanese society is changing, if slowly. Statistically fewer young people are interested in drinking and a movement is afoot to reduce the occurrences of semi-mandatory work drinking parties. The Japanese government, like the US government before it, worries about reduced tax income from teetotaling young adults, and is actively trying to get more drinks in young people's hands. Prohibition, however, is far from the minds of all but the most radical of the rare anti-alcohol crusaders. Despite all the efforts of the past century and a half, modern Japan remains a very wet island nation indeed. You're in like a bureau, that's right. That's right. All right, Mina, thanks as always for joining me on yet another journey into the Japanese past. Hope you found this one interesting. My research was sparked by a single paragraph in Lyman and Bunting's Japanese Drinks, and it really took me down a rabbit hole. I hadn't been expecting that the WCTU would play such a large role in the story. If you enjoyed this and want to hear me talk a little bit more about booze in Japan, I was recently on an episode of the Tokyo-based Sakamichi Brewing's podcast, Sakamichi Nights. Check that out if pods are up your alley. Also want to thank Illuminobi again for the superlative audio editing of this episode. And as always, everything on this channel and beyond for Unseen Japan is possible thanks to our Patreon members. A new video essay here on YouTube for their chosen topic is coming soon. Join up for early video access, topic voting, exclusive essays, and a member-only Discord channel. All right, quitting time. Ma, toりあえず生にしようかな. See you next time. Mata ne.